Welcome everybody to the 37th episode of the ABT Time podcast. Um, podcast that is built around the ABT framework course, for which we just wrapped the 25th round about oh, two to three weeks ago. We're a little bit on hiatus right now. And then as we keep uh, telling you, starting June 1st, it looks like we're going to begin what we're calling the Real Narrative Gym. And that is going to be a weekly event for everybody to join in Wednesdays at 11 a.m. Pacific Coast time in which two people will give presentations and then we'll have a whole team of like 25 builders that will analyze presentations over the course of uh, two half hour sessions. So it's going to be a lot of fun. We'll keep queuing you on that as we go along. Today, we have back our co-host from uh, coming to us from Melbourne, Australia, Jen Martin. Are you there, Jen? Good morning from Melbourne, Randy. It's lovely to be back. And what lovely hour is it right now in Melbourne? Oh, it's not too bad. It's 6 a.m. It's still still dark outside. The sun will be rising soon on a lovely Melbourne autumn weekend. We have beautiful weather in Melbourne at this time of year, nice cool mornings and then beautiful sunny days. It's divine. If anyone ever comes to Melbourne to visit, come in in autumn, in, in fall. Yeah. Wonderful. Um, let's see. I think about the last time you joined us here was probably maybe even in December, uh, we kind of got going the beginning of this year on a bunch of things, and then we had four concurrent rounds of the course going in February. Where Matt and I just got swamped, and so we kind of threw together a few episodes of the podcast. Um, what have you been up to since December? <laughs> well, I had a lovely, lovely holiday in January. That's obviously our long summer holidays, and so we took my husband and I took time off work, and we did all sorts of lovely things, and came back to the start of the school and the university year feeling vaguely tiny bit recovered from the fatigue of the last two years, um, and then promptly first week back at school, my youngest got COVID, uh, which went through the family, and I got really, really sick despite being triple vaxxed and relatively fit and all the rest so yeah while you were off gallivanting doing abt courses i was feeling really ill <laughs> uh, i'm so sorry to hear that i think that's what happened a couple of times we traded emails seeing if we could get you to line up the schedule and yeah you were just under the weather um yeah and you're, and you're still feeling some of the effects you said yeah so it's nine weeks on now and i still absolutely feel pretty rubbish um so that hasn't been fun, but you know, back we've got a new semester happening at work, so lots of wonderful new students, and yeah, yeah. kids recovered pretty well and got back to school, and uh, yeah, so look, I've been keeping busy, but yeah, if you can possibly avoid COVID, I highly recommend it. <laughs> <laughs> uh, let's move on to today's topic, and let's start today's topic with a simple question for you. How many fish biologists do you know well? <laughs> I was actually thinking about that when you talked to me about this episode and surprisingly I know a couple and they are really awesome people. I know a couple of the fish biologists who head up the fish unit at the Melbourne Museum and they are such great people. So okay, uh, right, the, right, give the us, fact give that us. I get to hang out with the fact that I get to hang out with some fish people this morning. I'm very happy, Randy. Okay, give us <laughs> give us three words, three descriptors for those fish biologists. Uh, eccentric. Okay. Um, all right. Eccentric, passionate. Okay. And dedicated. Bingo. I think all three of those work for our first special guest today. So on that note, let's bring on our eccentric, <laughs> passionate <laughs> and dedicated guest, Julie Clausen, coming to us from where? University of Illinois? Yeah, from Champaign, 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 Champaign. Illinois. There we go. Yeah. Hello, Julie. And um, let's see, I first met Julie a little over a year ago. Um, she was, you took the, the ABT framework course first, didn't you? I was in your first, you first had a demo, I don't know if you were way back then, you had a demo day. And then that demo day started to end the first course. Yeah. And I was in course number one and I retook it and took course number two. Oh, you were part of the Platinum Club. And I was part of the plan. <laughs> <laughs> Literally, that was what we called everybody. That yeah, right. took it twice. Um, no, that's that's tremendous. Uh, we'll have to have a platinum club reunion one of these days. <laughs> Good, definitely. Uh, and then you and Marlis um, came back with a vengeance at the beginning of last year, which would have been the eighth round of the course. So you were in rounds one and two. You went away, and then you both came back for rounds eight. And um, and then ever since then, the two of you have just been this wellspring of life and energy to the course. 
uh, doing the course 25 rounds was a pretty major undertaking over the court past two years. I mean, really just fit right in the whole pandemic two year schedule. We came up with it in April 2020 as a response to the pandemic. We had no idea as we kind of cobbled together the first idea how it would catch fire. It turned out to be the right thing at the right place as everybody was opening up the Zoom world. And we didn't know if that was functional or not. And very quickly, we're shown that, wow, yeah, this is what everybody needs. And I think for a good solid year and a half, so many people relied on the course as a piece of their life, you know, a little piece of structure that they got a lot of joy out of it. And it's really nice that uh, brought in people's kind of isolation in the pandemic, how much they enjoyed it. But that said, it, it really kind of peaked out in February this year when we ran the four rounds and the, the pandemic was still raging pretty strong, that final uh, surge. And then once that surge went by in, in March, you know, you could feel everybody was ready to be done with the pandemic and done with Zoom, I think, a lot of people. And I think a lot of people, unfortunately, the government agencies burned out tons and tons of people. I think they gave them too many hours of Zoom day in and day out. And we just picked it up from a lot of the agencies we work with. And we could see it a little bit in the, the lagging attendance in the last few rounds of the course. People were just at the end of their wits. So it, the, all, the timing all worked out perfect to wind it up with that 25th round. And here we are now working on new projects. Um, and so, you know, we owe a huge debt of gratitude to both you and Marlis um, Douglas, who also is from the world of, of conservation biology and, and uh, conservation genetics, I guess. And, and also she works with fish quite a bit. Um, one of the great things you did was in the beginning of last year, last February, you organized several rounds with fisheries biologists, but one in particular, you had 30 biologists. And in fact, tell us about that group, because it, it, was that your climate ambassadors group that, that it was the climate fellows group, climate yeah. fellows group that you began yeah. their year of training by taking the ABT framework course, right? So right. dive in on that. Yeah. So after, you know, after I saw how powerful the course was and really how, um, you know, how it really could uh, start this movement with, with a group of people, we, um, a group of us had applied for a grant to cover the class. And then we started, it's a year long program, but we wanted to start everybody with the foundation of the ABT. So everything that we do with that year long training starts with the ABT. So whether we're working on media, whether we're working on videos, whether we're working on presentations, they start with an ABT. And okay, so, so wait a second, are they, are they, they're done with that year now, right? They uh, did they're just in June, they'll be done. They'll be done, okay. So have they continued to get mileage out of the ABT training? Oh, oh it's. I can't tell you how powerful it is to have everybody speak the same language to when they say agreement, everybody knows what that means when, you know, and yeah. we do feedback sessions. And yeah. so we, um, you know, we do small group sessions where they try these things out and we always go back to singular narrative. What is your story? What's your Dubjanski? And it is just, I can't even tell you how powerful it is. It's just, um, that, that so shared language is so important, isn't it? As soon it as you is. have a group of people who can who can brainstorm with one another with the shortcuts that that shared language provides, it's such a game changer. Yeah, it, it really is. Um, wrap your mind around this little tidbit, which is, as I said, in June 1st, we're going to start this real narrative gym exercise once a week on Wednesdays, and it will be two people from our partner groups that will each give a, uh, a three-minute presentation and then the next 25 minutes for each one will be 25 of these builder folks, the graduates of the course that will set to work using the tools. And one of the things that we realized uh, a week or two ago is that when we start doing this thing, um, we're never going to announce who's speaking each Wednesday or what they're talking about. Because one of the things we, we found with the working circles is people start to decide whether they want to come or not based on the content. You know, like, well, that doesn't sound very interesting. Oh, that sounds interesting. I would be there. <laughs> that's not the point of this thing. You know, that that's content. And there's no way that we're running this weekly exercise to educate people about, you know, the design of jets and from the FAA or, you know, <laughs> their cockpit design or something like that. Um, the FAA ABTs are really fascinating. They're going to be one of the four partner groups for the first month of it. And their ABTs are always really interesting, the content, but that's not what it's about. It's, it's about working on these tools and then having that common language. And that's where you can run this thing and have people from the business and the law world and all these disciplines of politics speaking the common language. It's going to take a while for people to really start to see the power of that, but hearing it from you and you're seeing it there, that, that's just tremendous. That's exactly what it's, it's the bridge. 
Right. And it just drives mm-hmm. home this point of this, you know, this gym analogy is, you know, the ABT is certainly easy to learn, but to master it, you know, it's a, it's a lifetime journey. And so as you are able to dig and share and, and just remind, you know, when, when somebody presents and said, okay, now I think you're saying this is a hero, your story, but I'm seeing that, that you've, you know, you, that this could be too. And, you know, just that, that shared uh, dialogue where you're like, oh my gosh, I never thought about this, right? So there's no yeah, yeah. end point to it. You're just always learning. You're always um, growing and growing and growing. Yeah. Okay, so you are joining us today with a narrative. And if I were to try and take a shot at your Dob Jansky of what you're going to present to us, um, I think I would say that you're going to argue that nothing in fisheries biology makes sense except in the light of fun. <laughs> 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 wait, 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 what is that? Ver, this isn't mostly listened to on audio. What is that uh, t-shirt? Oh, I, it's cold here, so I have a I have a, a scarf on, but I have my fish. I have a fish t-shirt. Oh, okay, there. And yeah. that's a fun wear, fish t-shirt. wear your fish proudly if you're. Uh, um, you're did a I fan. nail it on your Dobjansky there? Well, I think you got it. All right. So then that, <laughs> that's your that's your theme for this entire episode is that nothing in fisheries biology makes sense except in the light of fun. Uh, now, following that theme. Tell us a little bit about your background getting into science and fishery. What drew you into fisheries biologists and what made you start to have that realization that it's lots of fun people? Well, what's somewhat ironic, I grew up in a farm. So I grew up, uh, you know, a tomboy, barefoot, out, you know, feet in the stream, you know, riding a horse, all that stuff. So out being outdoors was a was a huge thing. But I um for some reason early on in my life, I knew that I didn't really want to work with people. And <laughs> <laughs> Wait a fish, second. Fish people, fish people. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> Uh-oh. I, 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 which I think sort of translated into, I didn't want to have to be like happy, right? Yeah, you know, you're a nurse or you're, you're a, you know, you're, you're in the, the um, people industry, you know, you got to show up and you got to be nice. And I'm like, I, 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 <laughs> I want to be doing my own thing. And so, um, you know, I'm, you know, wait, wait a second, wait a second. This, this emerged for us early on with the different groups we work with. And people said, when you look at uh, fish and wildlife service, versus National Park Service, you see that divide. National Parks, people go into that to become park rangers and, and hang out with people, exactly. Right, right. And the, the, the fish and wildlife folks, you know, tend to be a lot of loners that love being out there in the field all day long by, by themselves and counting fish or whatever, as you're saying. Interesting right. divide there. Okay, keep going. Right. And you, you know, and what's ironic is nobody, you know, nobody works in a, in a um, vacuum, right? You're, you're dealing with people. And then I ended up when, you know, later in life and communication. So it's all kind of ironic, but that's what. <laughs> 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 and so I looked at fields that, uh, you know, that were possible. And so biology and then really fisheries, I fell into it. It was the first, uh, it was the first internship that was available. And then that, that, uh, you know, I think once you get your feet in the water and your head in the water, um, Mm -hmm. the mask and snorkel, it is, it's really entering a whole different world. And I think that's why we're different than wildlife biologists or, you know, insect biologists. When you put your head, when you spend a lot of time with a snorkel um, and mask and snorkel underwater, you, you truly feel like you are in a different universe. Well, you know what? I, I started college at the University of Kansas and the last summer I was there, I worked in the lab of uh, a fish biologist and went out with those guys and their little Boston whalers out in these reservoirs at night with their shocker units of of all the bizarre experiences. You go up in the shallow water and it's sending out the electrical field and all these fish come flopping up to the surface, all (laughs) electrocuted and you're netting them and throwing them in the boat. And, uh, it was fun. I don't know. It it was definitely fun. It was kind of a strange way to enjoy nature, electrocuting everything within sight. I mean, only one step better than dying. Make sure people know that it doesn't doesn't, doesn't kill them. Yeah, exactly. But so you've done plenty of that, that shocking sampling. Oh oh, yeah. That's like one of my top 10 reasons fish biology is fun. You get to go backpack shocking, electro shocking. (laughs) (laughs) You realize, you realize that makes you sound a little bit odd, don't you? (laughs) <laughs> that, I, I believed I was my introduction was eccentric. Eccentric. That's there. There we go. There's true, the proof. True. Right. Exactly. Um, wait. What's the backpack shocking? It, same. Same concept. So fish are drawn to an electric current, and mm. so it is a way to um, to sample and um, you know there's quantitative and qualitative um, parts of that. 
Uh but just an easy way. So they're drawn to it and then their muscles just contract and they float to the surface. And so, and then you net them up. And once they're out of the electric current, then, then they're safe. So that's the, that's the concept. So the backpack shocker is literally a backpack with a battery and you flip it on and it's got a, you've got a pole that um, it, it shocks. So it's for like small streams and shorelines. Interesting. Mm -hmm. Wow. Um, And so then that, that began, well, I mean, did you, were you, uh, keen on fishing as a kid no not at all oh wow okay so it was in undergraduate that you really started to get into the fisheries um well you know it's funny when you're a biology student um and you, maybe you even remember this it's like what am i going to be am i going to be a bat biologist am I gonna be a fish biologist i'm going to be birds mm -hmm. you know and you sort of try it all out and um you know, some people gravitate really quickly. And um, it really wasn't until my first, you know, after I graduated and did an internship that I, I really got deep into the experience of, of fish. But, um, uh, yeah. you know, that, that's funny because I simply headed off to be, become a marine biologist and then transferred to the University of Washington and got into a zoology department there that had an excellent program in invertebrate zoology. And I just said, I want to be a marine biologist. And they said, good, go take these courses in vertebrate zoology. And I took that and I said, so this is marine biology, I guess. And had I gone to some other pro program where it was, you know, ichthyology was their strength, I would have probably become a fish biologist. It was just mm -hmm. because that's what they all did. Diana Padilla and I both were in the same courses that were, were really tremendous. Uh, and so I got a big grounding in that area and not so much in, in another program. I probably could have ended up being a whale biologist. Who knows? Uh, all well, and I think, you know, to, to, tying this to communication, I, I don't think that professors really realize their power, their communication power to drive that interest. Because yeah. if you take a, a parapsychology yeah. course, you are either fascinated and love it and think about it as a career or you're like that was the most boring thing i ever took yeah no no very very true yeah to, to that very point uh, and as an undergraduate at the university of kansas there was a, a professor there clark bricker who had been part of the manhattan project and he taught introductory inorganic chemistry and the guy was the, the most charismatic professor ever um and he'd won the you know best professor year award year after year and I almost went into inorganic chemistry because of that one guy, like, I hate mm -hmm. this content, but man, this guy's so fascinating. All right. If that's what he says I should do, I'll go do it. <laughs> yeah, that's, it's fascinating. All of which um, is laying the groundwork for what we're headed towards, which eventually is one famous ichthyologist we're going to be talking about in a few minutes. Um, tell me more about, you are not Dr. Julie, you have a master's degree. And how's that experience been? What did you, you did the master's in what and where? At uh, University of Toronto in zoology. And I made a, a pretty conscious decision. Um, I, I also married a fish biologist who has a PhD. So <laughs> okay. it's all in the family here. Um, and I made a pretty conscious decision that the reason I became a fish biologist or, or biologist, the reason I love it and the passion was being out in the field. And uh, I worked for, I'd worked for a number of PhDs and they just got stuck behind their desk. And mm -hmm. I was like, that is not why I am in this. I don't want to lose my passion. I don't want to spend my life, um, you know, in, in front of a computer. So uh, I just thought that was a better track to go. And, you know, knock on wood, I've, I've been able to navigate a career. I mean, well, are, and you have, you have such I'm, good. Yeah, you have such good communication skills. I mean, that's just a, a sort of natural attribute, um, which I think is drawing you into exactly what we're doing these days. And then um, in addition to that group um, of the climate am ambassadors, is that what you call them? Climate yeah, fellows? Climate ambassadors and climate fellows, yes. Okay, and climate fellows. So in addition to that group, um, you also brought in another one or two half groups into the course, I think as well. But the main one was that group of the climate fellows yeah 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 some of the ambassadors um because we talk about the abt but they weren't able to take the course then they that they had a group john pole and, and that group they got they got together and said this is too important we're going to we're going to get a group together yeah and are all of those people eccentric passionate <laughs> and dedicated <laughs> would you say <laughs> absolutely the fellows are all fisheries biologists and um, I mean, they are, I just sort of think of them as on the front lines, right? They work 
so hard. You know, they don't get paid a ton of money. They yeah. see the effects of, you know, whether it's climate change or whether it's urbanization or, um, you know, whatever it is, they see the pressure, they care about it passionately and they are, you know, they are the face. They're out there mm-hmm. talking to the anglers, talking to the public. And so they, you know, they see it all. They see the importance of good data and science-based evidence, but then they see the importance of, of being able to tell a story and connect to. All right. T- tell us about, cause we're going to, again, we're heading towards one really prominent fish biologist, but in your experiences, tell us about one, the, the very best possibly fish biologist that, you know, that had the biggest impact on you, um, aside from your husband, which is <laughs> oh, <yeah. laughs> obligatory. Really important. Right. Um, so uh, when I first came to the um, Natural History Survey, it's a, a, a department of the um, of the University of Illinois, and this was an old school biologist and fish biologist, pretty famous. And he took me out in the field like my first week there, and um, and he kept going, "What's that plant? I, go, I don't know. What's that tree? I don't know. What's that bird?" <laughs> He's like, how are you going to be a biologist if you don't know these things? You can't just look at one thing. You got to have a bigger picture. You have to know what, how it's all connected. And, um, and he would, every time I went out with him, he would say, you know, we all like to be specialized, but we all need to be naturalists. We have to think bigger. And that connection, mm. you know, has really, really always resonated with me. And that sort of old school um, way to look at things. Um, it really, really influenced how it's I- such a powerful message. It really worries me how specialized we're all encouraged to become because the world doesn't operate in tiny little boxes. The world operates as a big, you know, interconnected, you know, I don't know, we can talk about ecosystems, we can talk about landscapes, whatever, but you know, being focused is not always the best thing. Yeah, it's not. Uh, and, the, and the thing that I, you know, we, we like our little boxes, but you know, we've got some really big scary issues happening and that's yeah. why every scientist needs to be a communicator because we can no longer afford to just have a few good people talk about the issues we all have to be on it all the time yeah yep um and and so that will take us then to our um second guest that we're bringing in uh in a few minutes and the connection here is that uh, the first year i was in graduate school uh, I was in a laboratory of marine ecologists, and across the hall from us was a professor named Carl Lehm, and he had four graduate students that all proved to be superstars in their own way. It was really, really fascinating group. Um, so kind of like the ultimate protege for him was George Lauder. I, I assume you know George Lauder. Um, and, you know, George Lauder was hardcore ichthyologist. Um, and these were all in this lab of Carl Lehm, who we're going to talk about uh, great fish biologist, ichthyologist. So the first one was George Lauder. Uh, second one was Joe Levine, who became eventually the co-author of Miller and Levine, which I think became the most popular introductory, uh, college introductory textbook uh, for a long, long time. It's kind of a major institution. He became a professor, I think, at Boston College. And great, great guy. Um, third one was Phil Lobel, fish ecologist, who ended up at Woods Hole and did very prominent work, especially on um, fish sounds and and mating sounds of coral reef fish, things of that sort. Um, And the fourth is my good buddy, Dana Ono, who uh, (laughs) night after night, those first two or three years of graduate school, you know, you're in there all night long in your lab. And he and I would take breaks together and hang out and, and jawbone about everything. And one of the things he said to me is, you know, that I, I love ichthyology and love fish, things like that. But I don't know about this lifestyle being an academic scientist. Uh, and so the year after he finished his PhD, as I recall, he's going to fill us in the details. But he went off and, and Harvard Business School had this, uh, I don't know if they still run it, but it was this intensive thing. It was a semi MBA program for, uh, I think it was PhDs, especially science PhDs. And he went and did that. And that helped him transition into the world of biotech. And so he's had a whole career working with biotech firms, I think a lot in venture capital, but we have been good buddies over the years. Um, And Dana, you want to join us on that note and fill us in on a few more details. First off on your background, uh, there's the, okay. All right. So first off to, to give the visual proof 
of our eccentric, passionate, dedicated uh, <laughs> concept. Dana is wearing a white t-shirt with black letters on it. And if we could tilt down your camera, Dana, I will. Uh, I got to stand up a little bit. Oh, you this. stand up. <laughs> His t-shirt says, when an eel has a maw with a pharyngeal jaw, that's a more. <laughs> <laughs> that's a more. <laughs> I told you eccentric, Randy. I nailed it, right? You, uh, you really, you gave us the three key words that absolutely are working very, very well. Uh, now, Dana, to start with, do you agree with those three words to describe ictheologists? Uh, uh, they're spot on. I, I mean, both Jen and Julie, I, I, I feel like I've known them all my life. I mean, they're <laughs> spot on. I mean, <laughs> she's got an albula. I mean, Julie's got an albula above her board there. And uh, and I love cats. I'm a big fly fisherman. So wait, I wait, 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 wait. What, what's an albula hanging for you? Going further? It's the bonefish. It's the bonefish. <laughs> it's hanging up there, the mount behind her. <laughs> okay. <laughs> How eccentric. <laughs> yeah, really. <laughs> um, yeah, and you've been a lifelong fisherman, right? A, a hardcore fisherman. Yeah, so I, I've, um, as opposed to um, many folks in ichthyology, I've been fishing since I was five years old, and I come from a fishing family from California. So my grandfather was a commercial tuna fisherman, uh, and then during the war, you may know about the internment of the Japanese Americans, and so his boats were taken and they were put into internment camps during the war. My father actually also fished on that boat. Uh, and okay, wait, wait, got... hang, hang on, take, take yeah. us a couple steps back. Um, so your your grandfather then was Japanese American, um, right? Did, right. Was he, he was the, the one that... first generation, first generation no, Japanese right. American. And, and he what, was what year do you think Beach. he came over? I'm oh, sorry. What year did he come to the U.S.? Uh, it was a, a kind of the turn of the century. Uh -huh. and, and then um, they set up in Long Beach and San Pedro, California, which was, you know, the tuna row or the uh, yeah. star kiss and all the other tuna. And so they had tuna clippers and they would go down uh, frequently uh, down to the uh, Nicaragua and, and Central America, fish for the tuna there and bring them back up into California, uh, Southern Cal, uh, where my father grew up. Uh, and so then we um, uh, uh, migrated to the East Coast after World War II, but- And so hang, hang, hang on, hang on yeah. one, one second. So then your father and mother were in Manzanar in tournament uh, My father, they were in, they were actually in college. My father was 18 years old at, at Compton State, if you can believe it, in the hood. Oh, <laughs> there wow. Was a, yeah, wow, wow. And, uh, and my mother, who he didn't know at the time, I mean, she's from Sunnyvale in Northern Cal, and she was at San Jose State as a 19 year old. And then they obviously could not finish their their college because they were thrown into camps. Were, were both My father was born, Manzanar. Were they both uh, born in the U.S.? Both born in the U.S., yeah. Uh, yeah but my father cool. was in Manzanar, and then my mother was in Heart Mountain, Wyoming. Uh, 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 that was where another one of the 10 internment camps, concentration camps, basically, were. Um, and so I'm on the board there uh, in, in Wyoming, on the Heart Mountain, Wyoming Foundation um, um, hmm. there. And there's some great stories which you can seg off, not the topic here, but there's some just fabulous stories. And I know Randy no, knows a few of them, but uh, there's some pretty interesting characters that are involved with this. Uh, um, I've become good friends with Tom Brokaw, um, uh, Norm Mineta, uh, Alan Simpson, Senator Simpson. There's a lot of players there it, it, uh, involved with the the. Uh, a Japanese American uh, community and what happened during that. But that's a to separate topic. Yeah, there. yeah, right. We'll do an episode on that eventually. Yeah. Um, all right. So then, let's see. You you actually were an undergraduate at uh, Juniata. In... Um, I was at a place called Juniata for two years in Central Pennsylvania, uh, but then transferred to Johns Hopkins to do my undergrad, where I had where I was going to go originally. But I decided against it, uh, so I, I turned it down. And fortunately, they let me. They accepted me the second time around. Uh, so I was in ecology at the time, working on copepods um, and uh, copepod ecology, basically zooplankton ecology. Um, but the passion for me was really fishes, and so. Oh, wait, hang on, hang on. Let, let's yeah. uh, dive into Johns Hopkins there because you spent time around Jeremy Jackson there at. Johns Hopkins. Absolutely. He was my ecology professor. <laughs> there you go. Exactly. And um, 
And his wife, Nancy Knowlton, is part of our ABT framework course. Um, yeah, I didn't know her. I didn't know her. Yeah, yeah. yeah well, they, they got married years after. He, but I, you know Leo Buss, and Leo yeah. Buss used to live across the hall from me as undergraduates. Leo was a, a crazy guy, and uh, we were both <laughs> the same age. And, and then he went on to go to Yale to, you know, to be a prof there in Evelyn Hutchinson's lab. So, yeah. Right, right, right. Yeah. Um, yeah. So he said that Leo was doing his PhD there at Johns Hopkins while you were. Leo, Leo was a strange character, even stranger than the rest of us, because he <laughs> did a he did a bachelor's master's combined program there uh, and uh, and then and ended up doing his uh, uh, PhD there. And then also Les Kaufman was a, uh, a graduate student there. So Les was a grad student when I was an undergrad there. And Les became a fish ecologist. And then Les moved up uh, to work uh, under Carl, actually, yeah. as a postdoc. Yeah. All right, right. Okay. Yeah. So, it's, all right, all, so then, it's so incestuous. The whole yeah, thing. yeah. So then yeah. you headed off to do your PhD with Carl Lehm at Harvard in ichthyology. Uh, right. uh, what did you do for your... Animus. Okay, what did you do for your dissertation work? <laughs> I can't even remember now. It, it was... Um, <laughs> We didn't have the right tools at Harvard, so I ended up going to the Marine Biological Lab in England, in, in Plymouth, uh, England, to, to mm -hmm. do my work, because uh, there was a lot of histology. So it was basically uh, looking at how patterns of innervation in fishes, you could do a systematic classification of fishes based on their neural components, as opposed to osteology and things like that. So it's kind of a taxonomic study, but based on function. Um, uh, and, and, uh, and so I needed to go to another lab because Carl's lab wasn't prepared to do this kind of work, which was great because I then was able to do some of my work in England as well and yeah. great stories from there as well. Yeah. So, yeah. All right. So let, let's, let's reminisce about what I remember, which was when you finished that PhD and then you went and took that Harvard, um, kind of MBA, com course. Com yeah, Rural compressed course. MBA thing. Oh, and yeah. you thought with your Harvard PhD in biology that you would be a hot item out on the, the biotech job market. And I remember talking to you after a few months of that, and you said, God, I get out there and there's guys that have multiple law degrees, medical degrees, MBAs, all that sort of stuff. And just these, these animals running the whole, the well, actually, biotech world. actually this anecdote will well, I think uh, work well with what you're trying to do in this podcast right now, because you're right, Randy, I, I took that program while I was doing a postdoc. I was at UMass Medical School doing a postdoc for two years. And my second year was when this Harvard Introduction to Business program came about, which was taught by uh, uh, MIT Sloan uh, professors, as well as HBS professors. On the campus of the um, uh, Episcopal a church in Cambridge and it was a 13 it was brutal it was 13 hours a day case study six days a week I mean it was <laughs> the only thing worse than this was taking a program in Woodsaw at the MBL nothing was as brutal as the MBL's program but this was way up there mm -hmm. um but um yeah so it was a program that um was supposed to translate your skill sets in the sciences into business. And that was what they were trying to introduce you to. So as Randy said, I come out of this program after doing two years of postdocing, which when I had taken a leave of absence to take this special program. So I started to submit resumes. I threw resumes out everywhere. There are 300 resumes, zero interviews from that. <laughs> and I thought, how is this possible? Six and a half years for a PhD, two years for a postdoc. I can't even get one interview anywhere. And then I then I um, kind of sat back and thought about it more and, and thought, well, what is it I've done wasting my entire 20s? What, what have I done? <laughs> and uh, the common denominator was I had to do a lot of writing. I had at that point written 10 journal articles. I'd written a book on fishes by then. And then to make ends meet, because we only had these little pre-doctoral NSF fellowships uh, and living in Cambridge wasn't uh, easy on that kind of stipend. So I was writing for trade magazines, highlights for children, um, a crazy stuff out there just to make ends meet. And then I realized, oh, maybe I can enter the job market as a, uh, as a technical writer translating technical to lay language 
and get my foot in the door. So when I rearranged my resume, I got five job offers right away from that, but five job offers, three were in high tech and then actually four were high tech and one was a biotech company. And mm -hmm. um, the biotech was just starting then, Genentech, you know, Biogen, they were just all starting. And I managed to just get my foot in the door because nobody knew what biotechnology was then. I mean, this is, we're talking early 80s at this point, 84, 83, 84. Uh, and so nobody was an expert. Today, I would never get a job in there because it's so specialized, as Jen saying, everything's so specialized now. Um, and I got in and um, that's kind of where I've, um, uh, you know, spent my entire for almost 40 years in starting companies, biotech companies. You know, mm -hmm. I was a venture capitalist for 15 years and I'm and what I but I hated venture capital. I, I'm terrible at it because <laughs> Uh, uh, I hated to tell entrepreneurs, no, 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 we're not going to invest in this. We're not going to invest in that. And so in the last eight years, I've gone back to what I really love, and that's creating companies and, um, and uh, talking to entrepreneurs. In fact, um, uh, again, to get back to the podcast, uh, what's important here is I've been using ABT and translate, and Randy knows this, and translating as an extension into the biotech world um, to the PIs, to the scientists who, you know, are terrible at telling stories and especially in front of money people, investors. And so um, what I do now as an entrepreneur in residence for several universities, that's what I kind of do now and incubators is I will sit down with entrepreneurs and let them give their pitches, their elevator pitches for starting their companies. And, and I'll do the same thing there is, you know, you gearheads are terrible. You can't tell your story. Venture capitalists get bored within the first two minutes. You've got to hit them quickly with one or two slides, the money slides. Otherwise, you, you lose the audience immediately. And so my job is, is kind of to use ABT. In fact, I have to give a talk in two weeks to, to a bunch of CEOs um, that are that have some venture money and some are just starting. And in there uh, is buried a lot of Randy's ABT um, uh, uh, from his book, Don't Be Such a Scientist, and these things are in there. And I've been trying to get entrepreneurs to, to understand that the science is important, but that's only 10% to become a successful company. I yeah. would say half of it is storytelling. To be able to get uh, all right, all right. So that that is that's the perfect segue then into our major um, topic for the remainder here, which is Carl Lehm, um, your thesis advisor. And here's how I want to enter into this topic, which was uh, what the hell was it your your 40th birthday party that you had in that private room of that Asian restaurant downtown Boston? I came down there. And you had about 20 people in that room around like this rectangle uh, table <laughs> and Liam was at one end. And I'm telling you, I remember that night as I left driving back up to New Hampshire, the muscles in the back of my head were aching from laughing for, for like two and a half, three hours nonstop. And talk about a storyteller. Carl Lehm really was probably the greatest storyteller of yeah. any scientist I've ever known. Um, he, he was a madman. He was a short little guy who was what Dutch Indonesian, right? And just, yeah, and um, and just funny as hell and a practical joker. Um, great and teacher. great and teacher. great, great, great teacher. Great yeah, teacher. tremendous teacher. Uh, a guy who was one of the first victims of political correctness in the early '80s. You know, he gave lectures and he did things that were politically incorrect that were hilarious. You remember the one giant debacle that happened was he, um, to, to illustrate metabolic scaling, he told the story about, was it Albert Hoffman, the guy who developed LSD? And Hoffman did these experiments where he gave LSD to different animals and he gave it to an elephant they brought in his laboratory and they gave the dose to the elephant, just linearly multiplying it up to what you give to a human which is wrong. They should have multiplied it by the 0.75 exponent. Cope's, Cope's law, yeah. Yes, exactly. And yeah. so by just going literally, they gave this poor elephant a mega dose of LSD. And then in his journal, 
Uh, so Liam telling you all about that. And then to help illustrate this, he read from the journal about how this elephant just went crazy and stampeded around the lab and finally burst through the wall of the building, ran out in the parking lot or something like that. Just this utterly insane uh, account of what happened as all the students are screaming and howling with laughter. And the next thing you know, somebody wrote a big article in the Boston Globe about how insensitive this was to ridicule animals, make fun of them. And then there were two or three other things like that. This was the beginning in the early 80s of political correctness. It didn't exist before that. Right. You know, you could tell any crazy joke you wanted to. And I heard some really foul stories from professors there in earlier years. But um, the sad thing that began to happen with him a little bit was you saw him pulling back on his humor. And this is this is the, the casualty, the byproduct of political correctness. This is matching our last episode, which was about environmental comedy. And um, we had a, a recent Harvard grad guy who graduated last year, did his undergraduate thesis on, quote, climate comedy. And I had him, he's a great guy, he interviewed me a year ago for his thesis, and everything I said was just kind of sourpuss. And, uh, you know, I said, it's a contradiction in terms, you can't have any climate comedy, because climate is so politically correct, it just stamps out anything that's truly provocative humor. Uh, no sooner did I tweet it out a few days ago than my buddy Andy Revkin jumped onto it, and started putting all these links on there. Well, look at this. Here's a whole bunch of crazy, hilarious uh, comedy. And sorry, none of that stuff is very funny to me. So he and I went back and forth on Twitter a little bit about that. And, you know, comedy needs to have no limits on it and be unbounded to get into really provocative, crazy things like that. And that's what you started to see happen with him was he was getting beaten back. That was the beginnings 40 years ago now of what today is, you know, it's the woke movement now that is just eating itself alive and finding out, I don't know, it's, it's very sad. I don't wanna advocate for offensive humor, but it's sad to see the byproducts of too much of that control. And we saw it with Lean because he got into a lot of trouble. Do you remember some, there were two or three other incidents that um, he got in trouble for. I mean, that was maybe after you left, but yeah, he was, um, but he was so damn funny. And here I got to tell one story that I remember about him that was one of the funny because he told it that night at your dinner, which was um, he was one of the instructors. Three they had three instructors in the intro bio course, and the guy that was the taught the genetics part in there um, ended up being sick for the day where he had to present Hardy Weinberg equilibrium equations, and so he asked Liam to fill in for him, and Liam jumped in without reviewing the equations very well himself. And the next thing you know, he's in this big auditorium with like about three or four hundred students presenting these equations 2pq plus 2q blah, 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 and getting it all upside down and backwards and the students begin to try and correct him and say no i think you need to put the q over there in the q and it was all videotaped and it was horrible and he finally had to just call it off because he'd made such a mess of the stuff that he failed to review during preparation and so then at the end of the semester and again you couldn't do this today at the end of the semester all the teaching assistants the teaching fellows as they call them there at harvard like a dozen of them came running in his final lecture they came running into the auditorium dressed up like bonsai kamikaze with, in white outfits with headbands you know like terrorists basically and they grabbed him and threw him down a chair and duct taped him in the chair picked it up put it on the big table forced him to stare at the screen and then they played back the video of him botching the the hardy weinberg I equation forgot that. I forgot. remember that yeah, yeah it's all I the forgot. students howled and screamed in laughter and he had to just sit there and watch himself ruining his own lecture um, the night he told that at your dinner party, uh, I bet, you know, that story went on for like 10 minutes and everybody's screaming with laughter. He was such a good storyteller. Uh, but again, you know, you do that today and the campus police would be there arresting everybody that are dressed up like terrorists or whatever. It was a different era back then. But Leem had that crazy energy and was so passionate and so good. And then we have that one clip of him in my movie Flock of Dodos, which was, um, he eventually had heart problems. He tells about he had eight bypasses in a single surgery there. And then eventually, you know, um, it was about 10 years ago, he finally succumbed to that, I think. But uh, tell us a few more things about why, or how inspiring was Liam as a professor? Oh, I mean, if it, if it wasn't for Carl, I mean, Carl made my career, no question about it. If it wasn't for Liam, um, I, I, I don't even think you know this, Randy, but when I was applying to graduate schools, I didn't get in on the first shot anywhere. I mean, I didn't know how to play the game at all <laughs> and uh, that you needed to you know, find a, an advisor and so on and so forth. So I entered Harvard um, uh, as a technician uh, the, the summer before. I didn't lose any time because the, after graduating, um, uh, I just decided to take a gamble because I wanted to work with this guy, Lean. 
And, um, and so he said, look, I have three graduate students already. So I got to pay attention to these guys. Okay. And, uh, but I'll, you know, I'm not going to pay you anything, but you can help clean tanks out or whatever, just to be in the lab. So I said, yeah, let's do that. But how luck sometimes happens, it turned out that he was named the chair of the admissions committee that fall going into it. Um, but he, where he was really good was he was a very good uh, guidance counselor. And so he had already lined me up to, to be a graduate student at a bunch of places. And it looked like I was going to be heading to Yale with Ken McKay, actually. That's uh, to work in the Rift um, Valley in Africa. That was kind of where I was gearing towards for the fall. And then he got this serendipitous thing where he's now the chair of the admissions committee. So he said, oh, this is ridiculous. Why don't we just put you right into this, to the slot there? You still got to be voted upon. You still have to have the grades and all this kind of stuff. But fortunately, I did. So it was, I just didn't know how to play the game. <laughs> and um, so, um, uh, so then I got in uh, and I didn't miss a beat then. I just uh, matriculated right into the fall. So, uh, so he, uh, let, let he me really ask you. made... What's yeah, that? Uh, Julie, did, did you hear things about Carl Lehman, the world of fish biology? Oh, you're mute. You're muted. <laughs> Sorry. Um, uh, I mean, he's famous, right? I, you know, his name is is well known among you know fish, uh, especially in the in the taxonomy and 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 physiology. So uh, I I knew of him, but um, you know, it, it's a little bit out of my discipline. <laughs> <laughs> uh, all right, Dana, we got to tell a few more stories about Liam. Well, I was going to um, say there's so many stories, but I can't repeat any of these because we'll never you're going to have to edit everything. out. Oh, well, I'm, so I'm going to repeat one because th this one's not that that crazy offensive. Uh, but um, <laughs> I, I love the story about um, George Lauder, his prize student, you know, his protege who graduated. And this was back in, in before the days of the Internet and email and things like that. And Lauder graduated and was given a big professorship, I think, at UC Irvine. Right. And then Liam kept writing letters to him and calling him. And all of a sudden, George Lauder was too busy to have anything to do with him and wouldn't answer any of his phone calls or anything like that. And Liam got more and more angry, more and more frustrated. And so what did he do to get revenge on him? He published an obituary for George yeah. Lauder in Nature, <laughs> right? And all of a sudden... All these people, oh God, how did he die at such a young age? <laughs> and he just published it. <laughs> yeah. yeah. I mean, that's the kind of pranks that he did. Remember the other one he told about was um, what was it? He got mad at Dick Lewinton for some reason. And Lewinton, um, I forgot was it what about it was, the something Nobel Prize? Yeah, yeah, exactly. Some department. And, yeah. and Richard Lewinton, you know, was a very prominent population geneticist who was way up there in that world and on the cusp of being a potential Nobel uh, recipient. Yeah, he just passed away recently. That's know? right, recently. Yeah. And so yeah. Leem, um, when to, to get even with him for some bureaucratic thing in the department, one morning he calls, and this is when people were just starting to get phone machines. And then he calls and leaves a message on yeah, <laughs> his from office. Stockholm. <laughs> from Stockholm. No, congratulating him, saying, I, I just heard the news this morning on NPR. Congratulations. That's all he said. <laughs> And then he cued in a bunch of the graduate students about what he'd done. And, and they said he walked around all that morning beaming, you know, waiting for other people to congratulate him that he'd gotten the Nobel Prize. When in fact, it was just Leem's prank. So, so I assume, Randy, you're going to, you, you and Matt will edit some of this stuff? Of course, okay. yes. Okay, so Julie, this one you'll relate to, I think. This is a story. It's a fairly uh, sedate story. But when Carl was a graduate student, um, he, he did a couple of things on the campus there. And one of the things was he hated paying uh, parking, the parking meters for the cars there. <laughs> and so he literally put liquid solder into the slots of all the machines so you couldn't pay anything. That was one of the things. The one that was more nasty, I guess, was there was a professor there in uh, malacology or something, and they were taking a field trip somewhere. And Carl went into the museum and yanked down a, a bottle, a jar of these snail shells that um, apparently aren't found anywhere in the Illinois countryside. And so ahead of the field trip, he threw these snail shells out on the trail that he knew the, the group was gonna be coming by. The students picked those up and 
brought it to the professor and said, I can't believe this is the most northern client of these snail species, blah, blah. And the guy wrote a paper on it. Okay. <laughs> so it's it's stuff like that. And there, there were worse ones, I could tell you, but that's oh one that's fairly God. clean. David yeah. Wake. There was another yeah. one with David Wake. <laughs> Uh, at Berkeley, you know, and uh, who's a very famous um, 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 uh, evolutionary biologist. And Carl went to one of David Wake's students at Berkeley and said, look, I know you're going to Russia. Can you take one of the fossils from your museum? Of, and, and, and when you do your postdoc in Russia, uh, tell David you, you found this missing link of some amphibia and send it back. So he sent it back. And David wrote a technical article on this, uh, the systematics of this fossil that was in his museum <laughs> and published it, okay, it's stuff like that. So it well, borders on scientific, you know, it's really gets dicey. But, but you wanna know something? Do you know anything about William, Sir William Osler? So Sir William Osler is like the founding father of modern medicine. In the 1800s at Johns Hopkins, he was the guy that created the whole residency program, the first ever that, you know, lives on today. And there are all these biographies written of him. And one dimension of him you'll find on the Internet on his Wikipedia page was that like Leem, he was a massive prankster. Um, and it's funny because I got one big fat biography. I mean, had no mention of his pranks at all, but you can find him on all these websites. And one of the pranks that he did in the 1800s, like 1890s, he came up with this fake persona and he would go to these scientific meetings, medical meetings, and he would register at the hotels with this fake persona. And people would see that. Oh my God, that guy's going to be here. We heard so much about him. And there are all these stories that generate around that guy's fake persona name. And then eventually, Oh, and the guy published a paper on uh, it's a whole vaginismus or <laughs> some sexual paper that was a complete prank and all these pranks that the guy did. And then finally, he propagated the story that that fake persona guy died. He drowned in Lake Lachine in a boating accident. And it's all written up there. And he had a whole separate life of all this pranksterism <laughs> as he was doing all this super important medical research. Um, there's, there's, it's not a coincidence, that sort of thinking. And I got to say, the only thing better than Leem's pranks were to hear him tell the stories of the press, yes, yes. like that dinner that night, you know, that's uh, why I went home with a headache from having laughed for two yeah. and a half hours. Cause it was all him <laughs> just reliving each of these pranks. There you know, <laughs> you know, Randy, um, um, Liam was, you know, Harvard has the house system, the old, um, uh, European house system and, uh, Liam and his wife, Hetty were the masters and co-masters of Dunster house. One of the houses there. So, he invited, I'm, and I was an affiliate of Dunster House, and you know, you get to choose the tutors or whatever in there from the undergrad. So he had me over for dinner one night when he first became master of Dunster House. And after dinner, we're walking around, um, and uh, and there's all of these pictures of paintings of all the former masters on the in the eaves of the of the house. And he turns to me and he goes. Can you believe one day I'm going to have a painting of myself up there? They're probably sticking in some little teeny corner where you can't see it. But, but, but he was cracking up that somebody would actually paint a picture of him and put it up there. <laughs> to, to you know what? Someday I'm going to go visit Dunster House and then go take yeah, a picture of that see painting. If there is a picture. Yeah. I want to tell you one be. more, Randy, that, that yeah, yeah. Um, borders on, and I think I can tell this one, um, because it involves my wife too, um, uh, who was a grad student <laughs> also, uh, who Randy knows. Um, uh, when Randy wrote uh, his book, Coral Reefs and Cold Beer, which I don't know, Jen and Julie, whether you've read that book of Randy's. <laughs> but Never um, got published. <laughs> yeah. So this was the big introduction biology course at Harvard. Um, and um, uh, it's a big team talk course. We had 13 teaching fellows in, in, in it. And so we're on the back of the room uh, and um, uh, Carl was going to introduce the, the syllabus and the teaching fellows to the to these you know starry-eyed freshmen and and uh, who are going to take this big course. Probably 300 students in the in the class, 300, 350 students. And so we're all lined up at the top. I was the head teaching fellow. The next person next to me was a, a woman named Barbara Wu. So she's an Asian, right, with long black hair. And the woman next to her was my wife who is not Asian, okay? She's, she's and, and then the, the rest were down the line weren't. So Carl gives the introduction. Then he says, well, I'd like to introduce you to the teaching fellows. 
Uh, and if you could just, you know, stand up. And so he he says, oh, there's Dana Ono. So I stand up and he goes, there's and the next is B. Wu. And so she stands up and my wife is getting ready to stand up. And Carl just stops and he goes, I'd introduce you to the rest of them, but they all look the same to me. <laughs> and and there was this silence in the room. And I turned to B and I thought, here comes the lawsuit from some freshman's father who's some famous lawyer or something. He's going to just nail him. But it was dead silence. In there. <laughs> so that's how how he would just. He would just be so, um, you know, uh, uh, I I don't know what the word is, but he would just throw himself out there like that just for shock value. (laughs) Wait, I I think we could take a shot at what the word is, which is eccentric. Um, (laughs) Oh, yeah. There you go. Yeah. Also gutsy. Boy, that takes a lot of gutsy. Oh, yeah. Gutsy. Yeah. Oh, yeah. This is 1975, 76. So, I mean, it was. yeah, Yeah, Yeah. 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 Uh, okay, so Jen, have have we risen to the definition of eccentric, uh, passionate, and dedicated in our description of Carl Lehm? <laughs> yeah, I think uh, I'm feeling very proud of myself for having nailed it, I think. <laughs> <laughs> that is perfect. Um, very, very cool. And, you know, uh, that's, that's about as much as we got time for today. But uh, actually, you know, the last little thing I want to mention was... Uh, Dana, give, give us just a few quick words about Ken Miata. He, he wasn't a fish biologist. He was an uh, amphibian guy, wasn't he? He was a herpetologist. Herpetologist, yeah. yeah he wrote but, a book, Tropic Nature, with Adrian Forsythe uh, way back. And but, uh, but he was a hardcore fisherman, right? Fly fisherman? He was probably, and in fact, my father fished. My father was a really good fly fisherman, too, and he fished with Ken and said, and I agree, Ken was probably the best fly fisherman I've ever fished with in my life to date. I mean, he was unbelievable. He died at, at the uh, age of 30. He drowned on the Bighorn River in Montana. Every summer he would drive from Cambridge to uh, the Bighorn uh, and fish by himself. And he, he, he was found drowned by the Crow Indian tribe there. Uh, but a, a consummate fly fisherman um and what, a what is it what is all right so what is it about fly fishing that drives some people just crazy like that and obsessive um, what is your fly well, fisherman, right? well i was going to say that i think of fishes every day probably like julie i mean i'm i'm thinking fish every day but it's mainly because i build fly rods i tie flies every day i'm you know i'm i got uh, trips planned out south holston in tennessee at the end of this month, I'm fishing, you know, and, amazing. and so I'm fishing constantly. Yeah. And, and every, every just time an I talk to you, yeah, every time I talk to you, you're either going off on a fishing trip or coming back from yeah, it. it it's, a, it's an obsession. It's clearly an obsession. We'll yeah. have to talk, Dana. We'll have to talk. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Would hilarious. you like to buy some fly rods, Julie? I have a hundred fly rods in my collection. Oh, yeah, I'm always, uh, you know, Gee, okay. you have a hundred fly rods, a hundred yeah. fly rods, bamboo. Yeah. Wait, um, we class. we needed one more word on this list of descriptors, which is obsessive. Um, yeah, 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 yeah. I think so too. Yeah, yeah. truly. Really, okay, fi- final topic was that um that they did at the Ix and Herbs meeting. They did a tribute for Carl Lehm probably about ten years ago or so, and yeah. Dana got in touch with me about that, and he and I set to work, and we got a little bit of funding, and we put together this two part video that they showed that night at the at the meeting, and it's actually this is very relevant because um. This video was the ultimate inner circle video. You know, it, it really was directed to focus for just that one event. And everybody there knew Carl Lehm. And so it was a bunch of little kind of fun, fun moments about him, a little bit from his past. And then, Dana, you took the video there and you showed it. Tell, tell us how it went down that night. Um, no, it, was, was it? it was clearly um, it, it was clearly the, the hit of the entire um, show. I mean, th- those... I, Today, I still find those videos every time I'm feeling down and feeling bad. I just put them on and I just get a laugh every time I hear Leem's voice and his storytelling. Uh, but but at this function um, uh, where we had the four original um, graduate students, we had uh, pulled together and got a painting done of a, the one species that had been named after Carl, uh, a cichlid, which he had worked on. Um, and so we had presented his wife and his son with the painting, but I can tell you these videos were just well, well received. I mean, as, as you would expect them to be. Yeah, um, no, it was really, I, I really just, 
just really great. I yeah, mean, heart, just, heartfelt. And tell us last little bit regarding those videos. What's the biggest laugh that you got out of the videos? <laughs> Uh, it, it was probably the uh, uh, impromptu um, um, walking behind our fellow <laughs> grad student, Bill Abel, who to this day doesn't know probably what was going on. I mean, it was just... <laughs> exactly. So we'll post the links to those videos along with this uh, on the website. But yeah, that was the grand finale, which was, and then basically I did a dirty trick on Phil because you saw it faded out on him. Just <laughs> basically an and, and, and land just going on and on and on as it faded off. Um, but that's, I had to do it in the spirit of Carl Lehm and all the pranks that he's done over the years. So it absolutely matched. Um, yeah. uh, it, Julie, got any last things to say about the fact that fisheries biologists are eccentric, passionate, and dedicated? Well, you know, anybody that considers flannel high fashion, you, you got to love, right? <laughs> <laughs> well said. That is perfect. Um, cool. All right. And on that note, thank you guys very, very much. And here's to Carl Lehm, really one of the greatest professors ever and inspiration to everybody. And yeah, folks should watch those two little fun videos. They're about five minutes each to get a feel for who Carl Lehm was. So. Yeah. Thanks very much, folks. And here's to the next episode of the ABT Time Podcast. And talk to you then, Jen. Have fun. Looking forward to it, Randy. You too. Bye.